Welcome to Jackson Hole Seminars. We're here with Dr. John Mulhall, who is uh, one of the scientific board members. And uh, John is uh, an expert uh, in one thing, a great speaker. Uh, cannot uh, uh, get, uh, I, I don't know anybody that can get a better attention from the audience and be extremely uh, focused and deliver the message better than John. And uh, it's a, really an honor to be here. He, is, he was one of my mentors and he will be continuing to be a mentor uh, for me forever. Um, anyway, this is an honor to have him here and uh, uh, we're gonna interview in a way that, uh, so people, the new generation of your audience can uh, get to know you uh, without you interrupting them. So that's my pleasure to be here. <laughs> so John, uh, I know that you're not from here, United States, uh, like me. And uh, if you could just tell us a little bit where you were born and how sure. was your sure. uh, pathway to United yeah. States? Uh, my pathway was a little circuitous. Um, I was born in Ireland. I went to medical school at University College in Dublin and I graduated in uh, 1983, 1985. And I did my intern year in Ireland and then I took a year off to do a postgraduate degree in anatomy. Mm. Um, and then I spent two years doing surgical training, which at that time over there was um, across multiple specialties, hepatobiliary, vascular, general, and then I did urology. And I did urology with a chap by the name of John Fitzpatrick. Mm. John Fitzpatrick was Ireland's most um, prominent yes. urologist, and he became the editor in chief of the British Journal of Urology International. Yes. Yes. It was John who convinced me to not be a hand surgeon, which was my career ambition, and to become a urologist. And so then, as a foreign graduate, I moved to the United States in 1989. I redid uh, a transition year uh, in general surgery. And then I interviewed during that year and I matched at University of Connecticut and my chairs were Myron Walczak before he retired and then Peter Albertson, of course, after that. Mm -hmm. Then I did my fellowship in Boston with uh, Erwin Goldstein and Bobby Oates. Mm -hmm. And then uh, my dear, dear friend Bob Flanagan and mm -hmm. your friend um, offered me a job at uh, Loyola University Medical Center in Chicago and I spent six um, truly magnificent years um, at Loyola and then um, was offered an opportunity to come to New York City with uh, Derek Vaughan and Peter Schlegel and also Peter Scardino over at Memorial. And I've spent the last uh, 16 plus years in New York City, so I'm a, wow. technically a, a New Yorker now. That's awesome. And um, I know that you have family uh, in the United States. Yes, I have two sons. Uh, John is uh, 29 and Cameron is 17. They uh, becoming urologists, or yeah. they are urologists. Well, no, uh, John Christian is a uh, is a uh, New Jersey police officer with ambitions to be an FBI agent, and wow. and uh, Cameron keeps saying he wants to be a urologist, but I <laughs> I don't know that he's going to be a urologist. He's smarter than that. <laughs> Do you still have family in Ireland? Yeah, sure. My mom and my two sisters are there, and my wow. two nieces. My my dad passed away in 2011, and. But I get back um, two or three times a year. It's yeah. a uh, five and a half hour flight, so it's pretty easy. I'm going back in a couple oh, of weeks to right. see, uh, see Ireland play rugby against uh, France. So, <laughs> yeah. so what, what triggered you to come here? You know, in 1989, Ireland was pretty economically deprived and the training system in Ireland was very pyramidal. Uh, there were, you know, a dozen people at the base and then one person would get a job. And right. at that stage, there were 16 urologists uh, for approximately 4 million people. And somebody had to die or retire before they made a new urology spot. The system has changed now, but, but then it was uh, very pyramidal. And uh, I made a decision that, no, I'm going to make an effort to go to the States and for things to be a little bit more certain. And I think, you know, American urologists don't understand this, but, you know, you're assured a job when you graduate. There's no unemployed urologist in the country. So that's not the way it is uh, in Ireland, or wasn't then. And there were many people who wanted to be urologists who had to leave and go to Australia or Britain. Mm -hmm. So that's how I came over in 89. And, uh, you know, we see you all over the world. 
and you have a, such a busy practice. Yeah. We keep talking about burnout, time management. Yeah. I mean, you accomplish everything you wanted. You're president of your society. You're well known, very, very well known uh, urologist uh, in the world. Um, how, what is the secret yeah. for you not to burn out? And how do you manage your time? You know, it's very interesting. It's, um, you know, to be very kind of honest and dark about it. Um, I think there are three things you can do with your life. Um, when you finish your residency, you have a decision to make. Mm. Uh, you can focus on making a lot of money. Mm. You can focus on spending time doing the things you love, including mm. spending time with your family. Or you can be a true world leader. Mm. And you can only do two of them at any one time. And if being a true world leader is not on your radar for the first five years of your career, it's going to be very difficult to be a true world leader. And I think if you speak to any of the founding fathers of modern neurology or the people who are um, the elite academicians now, I think they would all admit to you that they made sacrifices. Mm. And this work-life balance concept is very interesting. Um, and I understand why it's a focus of many young people now. Um, but I think the days of us finding people who have 600 papers on their CV is probably gone. Um, I think that I made a lot of sacrifices. Um, I miss birthdays and anniversaries when I was doing things. And um, so I, I, I think that I don't regret that. I'm very pleased with how my career has turned out. But I think it takes a certain personality. And I have some very dear friends in urology who would never have had any, any interest in doing what I did. But I think sacrifice is, is not um, uncommon. Mm. And I think if your focus is your family, it's going to be very difficult mm. to make a lot of money and be a world authority. Mm. Um, this is a very personal opinion, but you know, how looking back over 23 years in academics now, I, I think that these are truisms um, in our space. And uh, what are the places that you visit that you say, oh my God, this is not what I expected. It's better or worse, and uh, why do you feel that way? Is it people or the infrastructure? You know, I'm the kind of guy who extracts the, the positives from nearly every situation. Yeah. So I go see a bad movie, I always look for what the positive things are in the bad movie. That's, uh, um, yeah. So wherever I go, I'm looking for the positives, and, and really, you know, um, there are very few um, true benefits to being an academician anymore. Mm -hmm. And one of them is being in contact and networking with other academicians. So for example, I'm very fortunate this year I will do three visiting professorships mm -hmm. um, at Duke, Emory, and uh, Oregon Health Sciences. And um, that is one of my favorite things to do. Mm -hmm. And the reason is that I get an opportunity to interact with residents, mm -hmm. right? And mentorship has become a very important part of my career. And when you speak to my fellows, they will tell you I spent a lot of time with them talking about career choices and what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. And so I love that academic camaraderie. And one of the great things about this meeting, of course, is that its, um, its mantra is camaraderie. Right? We have the uh, presenters and we have the critiquers, but at the end of the day, we get together for dinner and we have a good time and we connect and we network. And you know, I think that for anyone, young person listening to this, perhaps they need to understand that academic success is based on many different things. I talked about sacrifice, being in the right place at the right time. Mm. It's better to be lucky than good, mm. but networking with your peers and understanding what they're going through um, their promotion track, what's expected of them, et cetera, et cetera. So I think these are very important things. But, you know, I love what I do. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's true I travel a lot. Um, but honestly, I spend very short periods of time in most places I go. I go to wonderful exotic places for 24 hours. Right. <laughs> and, uh, um, but I love what I do. Yeah, swimming with sharks and I see yeah. all these uh, wonderful things. So, you know, it's interesting because I'm 56 years of age now. And at 50 years of age, my father had his first heart attack at 52. Oh. And at 50 years of age, I made a decision that I was going to try to spend a little bit more time on me. Mm. And of course, as you know, I'm a passionate scuba diver and underwater photographer. Right. And so I've made a concerted effort um, a few times a year 
to get underwater where my blood pressure is at its lowest mm. and recharge batteries. Yeah. Um, so yes, that's part of the work-life balance I've tried to be, I've tried to work on over the last few years. What do you, uh, what do you do when you are really stressed out? Because you're um, athletically, mm -hmm. you're so strong, you do martial arts, and uh, I probably promise you that that helps you to manage your stress. But uh, is there anything else? I mean, uh, you can't do martial arts in the middle of nowhere. I mean, yeah, no. So I'm, a, I'm, a, you know, I, as as you know, I was a um, an elite rugby player back in Ireland, and mm -hmm. um, uh, it's still a great passion of mine to watch and and uh, rugby. Um, the gym is really my, uh, when in New York, for example, or when traveling like here, is my mental health. I That's see. my spa time. I, um, I get, uh, when people talk about the release of endorphins when they're working out, I mean, that's absolutely true for me. Other than that, I'm a, um, I, I love culture. Yeah. So in New York, I'm blessed to be in a, in a city that has so much culture. I, I spend a lot of time going to theater and live music and, um, they're the kind of things, but you know, there's a limited amount of time to do that in. I, I have a very busy practice, as as you know, and um, I have four nurse practitioners who really, really work very hard, and uh, we see a huge number of patient visits every year, and it's a real challenge, not to enter into the burnout zone, and so we have uh, we call ourselves Team Penis, so we have <laughs> Team Penis drinks several times a year. Uh, we have team huddles every so often. Yeah. Uh, we're trying to we're trying to structure the practice to limit the risk of burnout, I which see. I think is a very serious concern now. So you, as a leader, you really design ways that uh, the members of your team they understand, they know very well that that's a real true concern for you as a leader. Therefore. Uh, that helps them to manage and cope with those stressful times too. Right? I think I would be lying if I said that this just came to me as a, you know, I, I, I knew that this is what I should do. I think that there's been some people on my team who prompted me to um, spend more time not in clinic with the team members uh, to express my appreciation more often. I think as busy surgeons, we're running around, and I think in residency, you, you tend not to get a pat on the back. Mm -hmm. you, you tend to get criticized if you do something wrong, and people right. don't often say to you, you know, I want to thank you for a great job you did today in the operating room. So I tend to make that effort now, speak to the fellows, good job today, right. uh, thank you for what you're doing to the NPs. And I think that, you know, we talked about, we heard about during Ryan Terlecki's talk here, um, I think just being appreciative, demonstrably, de demonstrably appreciative mm -hmm. of the team, yes. I think is very easy to do. Right. And yet I don't think we do it often enough because we're just so busy. Yeah. You know? We were trained not to do, I think, uh, and that is changing. Yeah, I think, I think you know, how we are as surgeons 20 plus years in practice and how the young surgeons are now, we're just, we're just different from a societal and, and personality standpoint. And they're probably better at that than, um, than we have been. But these are easy things to change. And so I'm making a concerted effort now to be more appreciative of people around me, the office staff, the OR staff, the, um, my team around me in clinic. It's not that I was malignant, or, but I don't know that I verbalized my uh, yeah. thanks. Communicated that yeah. way. Let me ask you this. You're a uh, very uh, a well accomplished uh, surgeon. As you live uh, your routine life, can you separate the way that you think as a surgeon and just instead of, uh, oh, I'll do this and do the second step is this and third, but if this doesn't go the way that I want to, uh, you know, that's what I'm going to do. It's like peeling a uh, banana, peeling off a banana skin and uh, right. suddenly you see a rotten, uh, you know. I, I, do you do that? Or but I, I think we become surgeons, Fernando, yeah. because we are a certain way. I think the majority of surgeons probably lead their lives in a highly structured fashion, perhaps with the exception of when you're on vacation. So, you know, um, I run a very busy clinical and research practice. I'm an editor of a, a journal with a significant impact factor. Mm -hmm. um, I'm on numerous national and international committees. Right. And if I don't compartmentalize, and have a structured life, 
I wouldn't get anything done. Right. So I think it's hard to get away from that structure, and I think that's what makes us good surgeons. Mm -hmm. And I think, it, um, I think for the average person perhaps living with us, as you know, I've had two wives, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, that perhaps is a bit of a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a great role with the punches. On vacation, I'm totally loosey-goosey. Yeah. But uh, in my daily life, there are so many things to get done. I remember at last year's meeting, you gave a talk on this concept of we always try to squeeze too much into our time schedule, mm -hmm. right? So for example, on a routine Monday, I will have six standing telephone calls, mm -hmm. teleconferences, some of which sometimes end at nine o'clock at night, right? And I used to do these calls back to back to back and now we work on having buffer zones. Mm -hmm. Do two calls and an hour break. So you can actually take a deep breath and process what you went over, what are the action items, what am I supposed to do, following up from those phone calls. Um, but you know, it's, there's a lot of stuff to do. But I love being busy. Yeah. I love being busy. And you know, I, I think if you asked me what my career ambition would be, I think ultimately would be to leave some legacy behind. Mm -hmm. Has the literature that I've contributed made any difference to anyone? And I think if you look at our literature, the stuff that we publish, it tends to be questions that when we answer them will help a clinician in some way. Um, One I know for sure, our, good, our uh, paper we wrote SST, SST deformity, deformity many, many years so ago. That is a legacy. Many, but, many years ago. But uh, what, in terms of legacy of uh, uh, philosophical way of doing surgery, what, is, what would be your legacy? You, you know, I, I think that if you ask people in my specialty, I, I think they'd probably say he's tough, he's fair, mm -hmm. he's balanced, but he's to the point. Mm -hmm. And the single most important thing for me in academic medicine is understanding methodology. Mm -hmm. And I think, and I say this to the, the fellows, that the king is methodology and the queen is interpretation, mm -hmm. right? That you need to understand the methodology for Peyronie's disease interventional trials, for erectile dysfunction trials, for testosterone trials. Yeah. If you don't understand the methodology, you can't interpret. And I think that we've published many papers now that have tried to dissect out how to interpret the literature. Mm -hmm. And that I think would be what I would like my, for people to remember, oh yeah, he, was, he wrote a really good paper on that, or he was really critical of this. That's really what I think we should be doing. And I think you know, the whole concept of the journal club, right? Um, I think that journal club in residency is the single most important conference that we have. And during that journal club, I think our goal is to teach trainees how to interpret the literature. So, John, if you had to give a piece of advice for somebody starting a career as a urologist, what would be those words that you'd like to mm. I, I think that really in, in the second to last year of training, I think the trainee needs to start thinking seriously about their career path, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and I think the first and most critical component of that is they need to be honest with themselves, mm -hmm. all right? It's all fine and well to aspire to be a world leader, mm -hmm. um, but if really in your heart you want to be a family person and you want to um, do things with your family on a regular basis, and not want to sacrifice, I think that becomes more difficult. I see. I think the, the next issue then is really to make a decision, are you a private practice type person or are you an academician? And they both have their own sets of challenges. I don't think one is easier than the other. I think that both academicians and private practitioners are under intense pressure these days. Um, but I think just to be brutally honest with yourself. The second part, which is critically important, is mentorship. Right. You need to find a mentor. You need to find a mentor from residency. If you do a fellowship, your fellowship director should be a mentor. And you need to find a mentor in your specialty when you get into your specialty who's going to guide you. I, 23 years in the business, still have people I speak to for political advice, for career advice. And I think it's really, really important. For the academically oriented urologist, I would strongly encourage them to choose their first job based on their chairman, mm -hmm. your person, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. not the location. Not the location. Not the name of the institution, not the location, but that first chairperson becomes your lifelong mentor. mentor. And if that person isn't a good mentor, your career will have gaps in it and you won't have the same support that you would have if you'd had that mentoring type leader behind you. Um, and I think then just figure out what your balance is. Money, time doing things you love, and academic pursuits. Yeah. It's very difficult these days to get away from working on the weekends yes. if you're an academician. Yes. Um, Bob Flanagan, our dear friend, yes. I remember hearing say to me, but that's what Saturday and Sunday mornings are for. <laughs> he was saying it jokingly, of course, but you know, in reality, I think that's not untrue. Um, and finally, I think that you don't want to end up 10 years, 15, 20 years down the road unhappy with your choices. Mm -hmm. So choose something you're passionate about. Choose a specialty, subspecialty, type of practice, location that you're passionate about. Because yeah. passion just goes a long way mm -hmm. to keeping us in the game. Well, thank you, thank you so much, John. And uh, I hope to see you every year. It's my pleasure. It's my a pleasure. Scientific board member advisor, and uh, have a safe trip back home. Thank you, Fernando. Thank you very much.